formal introduction for Antoine right here, uh, but he's actually an amazing facility manager here for the North Andover Historical Society, so he works for us and he's great. We, d we didn't know he was great on the presentation front either until tonight. Um, all right, here's the official introduction. Antoine Trombino Aponte is the facilities manager at the North Andover Historical Society as well as the museum educator at the Bottomwoods Museum in Haverhill, where he oversees the development and facilitation of K-12 and adult programming. He strives to develop museum programs that could connect local history to a variety of extradisciplinary topics including linguistics, literature, pop culture and more. As a graduate of Bridgewater State University with a BA in English and a minor in history with a focus in English historical linguistics, Antoine's academic interests range from archaic language texts and translation and folk myth and culture to rhetorical and creative composition, music and poetry. Coupled with a background in historical crafts and reenactments, Antoine has fostered a commitment to bringing an all-inclusive, interdisciplinary approach to museum education. Thank you so much for presenting tonight, Antoine. Thanks for everybody to, uh, who's, who's here for the presentation. One more thing. This is a, a great free presentation from the North Andover Historical Society in the Warden Theatre here. If you are interested in making a generous donation, we have a donation box outside. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Joanna, for the introduction, and thank you again uh, to everyone for coming out. So, uh, like Joanna said, I normally work facilities here, so this is really fun for me to get to do some history stuff um, tonight. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm going to be telling you about the linguistic characteristics, the historical origins, and the sociolinguistic identity of the Greater Boston Area's signature accent and vocabulary, otherwise known as the Greater Boston Dialect. Um, first, just a quick word about the intersection between language and history. Um, so in the study of history, right, there are generally two main types of sources that we use to learn about the past. We have material sources, so things like artifacts or maybe artwork that sort of tangibly show us uh, what the past was like, how people lived. And then there's also textual um, sources, which quite literally tell us, right, with words, um, how people lived. And the latter are all filtered through language, right? Um, so just as a classical historian might learn ancient Greek or Latin in order to better make use of the sources that they use in their field, uh, as a local historian, I've sought to do the same thing for New England, right? Learn about our language, the way that people have spoken here from uh, the colonial period onward. And so that brings us to the Boston accent. And I figure there is no better way to start than with taking a look at some contemporary examples. So I'm sure we've all seen our fair share of like on-screen representations of the Boston accent. Uh, and many of us can probably pick out ways in which they might sound off, right? So I, I have here an image from the 90s classic Goodwill Hunting, uh, and that stars Massachusetts natives like Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. And if you've seen this movie, which I'm sure many of us have, um, you'll know that their lines are delivered in a pretty natural Boston accent. Um, it, it's a little exaggerated, but you know, uh, it's, it's overall pretty good. While their co-star, uh, Robin Williams, who is a Chicago native and in his own right was an esteemed impressionist, um, he's playing a character that's meant to be from South Boston, uh, yet who at the best of times uh, speaks with the wrong Boston accent altogether. Uh, it's a sort of like inconsistent, almost Boston Brahmin accent, but you would never hear that in South Boston, right? Um, and at the worst of times, he just drops the accent altogether and, and uses his natural speaking voice, and there's no shame in that. But um, with William's talent, you know, one of his main talents being doing voices, it's things like this kind of lead to the perception that the Boston accent is particularly hard to imitate. 
Um, well, uh, that's sort of true, and, and, and in some ways that isn't, but that's what we're going we're gonna to break down here. What it really all comes down to is native speakers. So if you're in, raised in any dialect, it's going to be easy for you to pick out the inconsistencies that someone from a different dialect makes when trying to imitate it, and vice versa. So um, basically, you, know, you can pick out what's wrong when someone's trying to do the accent of your, of your region. Um, <clears throat> so... I have here a dialectical map of the continental U.S. And this shows that we have at least 17 recognized regional dialects. Um, so related dialects on this map are rendered in similar colors. And it may be hard to see, but the Boston area is distinguished uh, very slightly from the rest of New England with this sort of like um, speckled blue here. Uh, which itself is distinguished from the Northeast, which is just rendered in a darker blue. Um, and of these 17 dialects, the Boston dialect actually covers the second smallest geographic area. It's only slightly broader than the New York City area. Um, all of these dialects have their own kind of intricacies that only their native speakers may notice, but ours is notably isolated from most of the country being really only dispersed in eastern Massachusetts and some parts of Rhode Island and Connecticut. Um, <clears throat> with this in mind, I'd now like to take a look at some contemporary representations sort of in more real time of the Boston accent, both by native speakers and non-native speakers, and we'll s see if we can keep up together and pick out things that sound right or wrong. Okay, so some of us might remember this Super Bowl commercial for Hyundai a year, couple years ago in 2020. Um, I remember this generating a lot of buzz and controversy for some, uh, you know, d different opinions on the, the portrayal, but we'll just play it and we can talk about it after. Oh, look at this guy. Hey, Rachel, how are you? Hey, good, how are you? He's not getting that car in there. No, sir. Look at these two troublemakers. Hey, Johnny, how are you? Wicked car, is that new? Yeah, it's a Sonata. Let me pack it. Oh, you're not fitting your car in there. Chris, stop being a smarty cat. All right? Look who's got smart pack. Smart pack? Just hit the clicker, car packs itself. It's smart. It's wicked smart. And I can pack it anywhere. How about Dorchester? Packed it. Foxborough? Packed it. The Garden? Packed it. Joggis? Packed it. Swampscott? Revere? The Harbor? Are you kidding me? I packed it and then unpacked it. You unpacked it? Kid. Game changer. That Sonata ain't got no driver. That's all right, he's got smart pack. Hey, you can pack there. He's got smart pack! Whoa, 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 it's Big Pop. Look at smart. This is a ghost car. <laughs> a better way to park. Only available on the all-new Sonata with remote smart parking. <laughs> okay, so I know many locals might be quick to criticize this performance for some perceived errors, like Rachel Dratch's incorrect use of Wicked, right? How could you screw that up? Uh, but I promise we'll come back to that later. Um, uh, other than that, though, I would say from a linguistic perspective, um, disregarding the performative aspect, I would say the actor's pronunciation and their vernacular, right, their word choice is actually pretty good. Um, I don't know, but what do you guys think? Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> so, um, that's because Chris Evans, uh, Rachel Dratch, and John Krasinski are all Massachusetts na natives. So I heard someone say it was exaggerated, and it definitely is, right? It's played up for TV. Um, but uh, Chris Evans grew up in Sudbury, Dratch is from Lexington, and John Krasinski's from Newton. So, s fittingly, they, they nail the little things that only natives would sort of intrinsically understand, right? Um, so yeah, no, sir. Um, how, how are you, right? Uh, not getting that car in there. So, like, it's and all the place names, right? That they, you know, they had to drop those because we're known for that. Um, okay, so with this in mind, now um, as an accurate portrayal by native speakers, uh, we can move and take a look at another media portrayal of the Boston accent. This time by non-native speakers. So, the clip I'm going to show next is from the 2010 film The Fighter, which is set in Lowell, uh, and it features Christian Bale playing the boxer Dickie Eklund, who is speaking with Amy Adams playing Mickey Ward's love interest, uh, Charlene Fleming. 
So neither of these actors are Massachusetts natives, and a lot of people don't actually know that Christian Bale isn't even from uh, the U.S. He's actually from southern England um, and normally speaks with a sort of you know, southern uh, London or, or Cockney accent. Um, please excuse some of the cuts in this video as it was edited for language, but uh, without further ado... What makes you say that? I ain't got no use for you, though, all right? Well, my brother loves you. And you can't just run away because of me. He don't deserve that, all right? So I will quit if you want me to quit. I swear to God. I will quit if it means you come back, all right? But I want you to think about something. Mickey has a chance to do something that I never did, that in my time I never had. Oh, yeah, my big chance was with Sugar Ray Leonard. Oh, yeah, I fought Sugar Ray Leonard. I've heard it. I came here to make things right. Okay, let's make things right. Yeah. Number one, you didn't knock down Sugar Ray Leonard. He tripped. What have you ever done with your life? I like my life. Yeah, what have you ever done with it? I like my life now, What have you Dickie? ever done with your life? You're a college dropout, Charlene. You're just a little bar girl. Your life sucks. All right. I drank too much. I worked in a lot of bars, and I ruined a lot of opportunities, but I'm trying to do something better here, and so is Mickey. And so am I. And he needs me, you heard him. And I know he needs you. Okay. I'll see you in Mickey's corner. All right, so what do we think about that one? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs middle. I'm, so, yeah, I'm hearing a lot of people saying that Christian Bale is good, but um, Amy Adams wasn't doing as well. And I would actually exactly agree. I'd say that was fairly mixed. We had one good performance uh, from a non-native speaker and one that was maybe subpar. But um, there, is, there are some pretty definitive reasons for that that we can talk about. So the obvious slip-ups definitely come from um, Adams. But she was raised in central Colorado, and she naturally speaks with a mixed western and central plains um, American accent. So she started a little bit stronger. Her pronunciation, I would say, of uh, Sugar Ray Leonard was passable, <laughs> right? Uh, but one thing she can't disguise and probably doesn't even realize that she's doing is her very distinctly Western and Midwestern pronunciation of words like knock out, which she, sa which she says as knock out. Um, and further into the dialogue, it breaks down a little bit more. Uh, she pronounces the R in bars. Um, and she keeps a very distinctive West Coast fronted pronunciation um, <clears throat> of words like opportunities. She says opportunities, um, rather than the way a Bostonian would just say opportunities. Um, this is the same sound, that ooh sound, that uh, West Coasters are kind of infamous for using in words like dude. It's, very, uh, it's a huge part of their dialect. It's not a part of ours. Um, and it's immediately recognizable to people from other parts of the country as being from the West Coast. Um, and interesting, interestingly enough, uh, the, our British actor delivered, I would say, a near-perfect um, Boston accent. Granted, uh, Christian Bale is rather known for his skill with American accents on screen, and just about every film he plays, almost all of them, he's doing an American accent. Um, so much so that many people just assume he's American. But... He does slip up a little tiny bit um, when he says, what do you ever done with it? Uh, that's a very characteristic, like, south of London um, way to say done. Uh, <clears throat> but it was pretty subtle, so if you're not trained to look out for that kind of thing, um, you might not notice it, and I'd say he otherwise passes well. So how is it, then, that our American actress had more difficulty with an American dialect uh, than a British actor did. Well, there are two answers to that question, but the first part comes back to what I've been saying about native speakers. The very simple fact of the matter is that all dialects have rules, right? And our Boston accent is no exception. So while the majority of us may not have the terminology at hand to actually articulate what those rules are, we do have a passive understanding of these rules as natives of the area, and we can follow them really without thinking about it, as well as pick out uh, a bad imitation. And that goes both ways. So um, a speaker of a different region like Amy Adams is just naturally inclined to follow the rules of their dialect. But once you know the rules of any dialect, it's pretty easy to mimic. So that's what we're going to look at next. 
uh, I'd like to give you all the terminology and go over what the actual rules of the Boston accent are. So it may surprise you that there actually aren't very many of them, and they're all pretty simple. Um, but the few rules that we do have really set us apart in some pretty big ways from general American standard English. Um, so the first, and in a linguistic context, I cannot stress enough the most significant difference between Boston speech and the rest of the country is what is known as a rounded lot pronunciation. Basically, uh, that just means we pronounce the vowel in words like lot, dog, and even Boston with a rounded sort of ah sound. Uh, whereas most of the rest of the U.S. will pronounce these words, the, these vowels, with a slightly more unrounded and uh, vowel that's more forward in the mouth, closer to something like lot, con, and Boston. Uh, that ah pronunciation is actually one of the biggest evolutions that distinguishes general American English from British English. Um, but in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, parts of Rhode Island, um, parts of Connecticut, parts of Vermont, and um, <clears throat> most of Maine, and actually even beyond Maine up into Nova Scotia in some areas, uh, we still pronounce that vowel in a quote-unquote older, more British way. Um, this rounding of the lot vowel also extends to words like thought and caught, uh, which ties into our next rule, known as the lot thought or caught caught merger. <laughs> so again, uh, most, most other American uh, English regions will use that same more forward, unrounded ah uh, pronunciation in words like thought um, and caught. But as note, this is noted as a merger because at one time in standard English, such words did not rhyme. Their pronunciations have since merged, uh, meaning the two, two different vowels have become the same vowel, except for in some places like New York City. Uh, one of my favorite examples to illustrate the difference um, is the word hot dog. Uh, so <coughs> Midwesterners will typically say hot dog, right, and that would be two unrounded vowels, while New Yorkers will say hot dog, right, which is one unrounded and then one rounded vowel. Uh, and we in Boston will say hot dog. So uh, that would be two rounded vowels. So both the Midwest and New England have merged their pronunciations um, of these vowels, but ours is just a rounded merger and theirs is an unrounded merger. And then New York is kind of caught in the middle. Uh, <laughs> The exceptions would be some parts of Connecticut and Rhode Island, where they actually lack the caught caught merger um, and pronounce these words with a split, meaning those vowels are different, like they are in New York City. Uh, so caught and caught. Um, and some parts of Vermont are also an exception, where although their pronunciations are merged, it's an unrounded merger, which is closer to the general American caught. Um, <clears throat> Like New Yorkers, however, we do have a split of our own, which is our next rule known as the father-bother split. Uh, simply, that means our rounded lot pronunciation has been retained in words like bother. Well, in some other words like father, uh, it has evolved towards general American. So typically, other American English speakers will pronounce words like father and bother as a perfect rhyme. So in New York City, they might say father and bother, uh, and in Chicago, they might say father and bother. Uh, but here in Boston, we usually have a split where, sort of like what New Yorkers have with caught and caught. Um, and, and, it, so, and all these examples so far don't just extend to only the words that I have listed here. They just, they extend to all words that share that vowel um, in, in that pattern. So, um, collectively, it is these first three rules, rounded lot, the thought-thought or caught-caught merger, and the father-bother split, that are almost solely responsible for the majority of difficulty non-native speakers encounter when they're trying to emulate a Boston accent. Because these rules in this very specific combination 
are not present just about anywhere else in the country. So there are variations and there are regions that have similar rules, but they don't have this particular combination. Um, so New England is not the only region with a caught-caught merger, but it is the only region with a rounded caught-caught merger, uh, which is by far the hardest part for someone like Amy Adams to nail, who has only ever pronounced those words and the words that rhyme with them with an unrounded lot vowel. And so she'd have to pay really close attention to not default to her native dialectical pronunciation. Um, and yet a rounded caught caught pronunciation is so unique to New England that when we hear an actor break that rule, it immediately sticks out to us, even if we don't know exactly why. Um, but that is not to say, <laughs> however, that our dialect has no relation to other American dialects, because there are indeed um, a number of features that we share with other parts of the country. Um, and the most significant <clears throat> Similarity is ironically perhaps what we are most notorious for. Uh, Boston's distinct non rhotic accent, also commonly known as R dropping. Uh, so, despite what we're most being what we're most commonly teased for, uh, R dropping actually isn't unique to New England at all. Um, several U.S. dialects, uh, including again New York City, but also Philadelphia um, and the coastal South as well, uh, drop their R's. So think like so how some Southerners pronounce places like Virginia. Um, I'm not a Southerner, I'm not gonna have a perfect accent, but I promise you they do drop their R's. Um, however, our non roticism is distinguished by the fact that it always occurs in conjunction with another rule, which is the backing and lowering of stressed central middle vowels. Uh, <clears throat> so if a vowel is described as lowered, right, that means it is pronounced uh, m with a more open mouth, as shown here, or closer to the tongue. So if you imagine this as kind of a map of your mouth, your tongue would be here, your throat would be back here, and this would be the roof of your mouth. Um, <clears throat> so this is a vowel chart. Um, so the letter R is not on here, but um, you can try this. The letter R is pronounced in the top front of the mouth. If you say R, um, the, the air would be hitting sort of either on your teeth or just behind them. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, with, it, with vowels being lowered and backed generally, that is the complete opposite direction of where the letter R is pronounced. <laughs> Right? Uh, so basically, our vowels are moving away, more towards the back and the bottom of the, the mouth, whereas the R is pronounced up front. So when you pronounce R following a vowel, it can be really hard um, to sort of make that transition. It's really subtle, but that's how we get car to become ka, right? Because you have to really open your mouth and kind of the vowels further back. I mean, if you try it out, you can feel it, but um, <clears throat> so. If I take a word like car and I pronounce it in a standard American accent without shifting my vowels, right, I'd get car. Um, if I do that and just drop the R without backing or lowering the vowel, right, caw, I don't get a Boston accent, right? That sounds more like New York. Um, and if I reverse it, right, and pronounce car with a lower back vowel but keeping the R, right, I get something more like car. Uh, which still isn't Boston, right? That sounds a little Canadian to me. Um, I'm going to poke fun at my girlfriend here for a second, who's hiding up in the rafters because I always do this. Um, she, <laughs> she has a family from Canada and can otherwise do a very convincing Boston accent, but her park your car in the Havid Yad is more like park your car in the Havid Yad. Um, just, be, just because that's the way her, her family says the word car. Um, and I think it's adorable, and uh, that's why she's hiding up there tonight. But uh, <laughs> So it perfectly illustrates how in the Boston accent, uh, R-dropping and vowel backing are sort of uniquely inseparable, right? So if a stressed syllable occurs... Um, in one without the other, it will stick out. It will sound like it's from a different region. Um, 
Our version of our dropping does have one other key distinction from other non-rhotic dialects, and that is that it will only occur if the next syllable begins with a consonant. Uh, so if the syllable following an R will begin with a vowel, even though the vowels are the ones causing all of this, the R will remain, uh, which is why Paki Kair and the Habit Yad is traditionally used as a test of a speaker's Boston accent. Most non-natives will not know to preserve the R between car and in. Um, and that's part of what I think made the, the Smart Park commercial good, right? Um, Chris Evans said he's not getting that car in there, so he kept the R, um, which is traditionally what you would do. Uh, <clears throat> however, this has also led to many Bostonians also inserting R's, uh, and sort of overcorrecting for this, uh, where they will insert an a, a vowel in between any two uh, an, insert an R, excuse me, in, in between any two syllables, um, starting and ending with a vowel, or sometimes they'll just add an R onto words where it wouldn't normally be. Um, so it's the difference between asking "Is my home?" or "Is my upstairs?" Right. So I put an R in there. They're really. The, the joke is that you're, you're chopping the R off the end of stairs and sticking it in, in front of it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, that, that's definitely a thing that sets our version apart from other regions of the country. But um, there are still some more features that generally coincide um, with the Boston accent simply because they apply to the greater New England region or even the greater Northeast um, at large. So the first is known as the raised short A. Um, so we're going to go back to the vowel chart. If a vowel is described as raised, that's the opposite of it being lowered. So it's pronounced more towards the top of the mouth, um, <clears throat> more higher up in the mouth, more towards the roof or the palate, or more with a closed pronunciation. Uh, than it would otherwise normally be. So replacing, oh, excuse me, uh, <clears throat> so raising the short A in uh, words like land or cab produces something more like land or cab, um, not only in the Boston accent, but also in many urban American dialects. Um, so they do this in Chicago, New York, uh, New Jersey, Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, anywhere where there's a big urban American city, um, you, you'll find this trend. And it's one of the cliches responsible for um, some European English speakers describing Americans as nasally sounding um, to them. Because in uh, uh, some mo most regions of British English, they don't have this vowel in the same place that we do. <clears throat> And raising the, the vowel in the mouth sort of imparts a more nasally quality to them naturally. Uh, okay, the next rule, which is known as T glottalization, is found in some form, right, in some form in every dialect of American English. So the glottis is the area of the throat where your vocal cords resonate. It's, it's roughly the area you'd feel vibrating if you were to hum that sort of down in there. Um, that's, uh, so the letter T is, or at least is supposed to be, uh, a dental consonant, which means it's uh, produced by touching your tongue to your teeth or just behind your teeth. Um, and you can try that too. Uh, <clears throat> so in most of the US, we actually don't pronounce T's that are preceded by a vowel in the middle or the end of words. So depending on the word, or where a speaker is from, the T might be reduced to a D. Like if I was to say get up, right? I'm not actually pronouncing a T there. I'd be using a D instead. Um, but it's usually fully glottalized into a short skip um, or a hum. So um, <clears throat> the form of T glottalization that is relevant to us, however, is in relation to nasal sounds uh, or the consonants N and NG. So Across the U.S., if a T sound would occur before an unstressed syllable, which contains the consonants N and NG, then the T will not be pronounced, leading to beaten for beaten, 
uh, mountain for mountain, and I work at the Buttonwoods Museum as well. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, some, but however, some speakers of northern and eastern urban American dialects also extend this T sound, uh, extend this to T sounds occurring after nasal sounds as well. So not just before an N or an NG, but also after. Um, and that's how you get dentist for dentist, uh, 20 for 20, or even accent, right? I'm not pronouncing a, pronouncing a T on the word accent. I'm just sort of skipping it altogether. Uh, <clears throat> you'd have to actually drive uh, pretty far, basically to the southwest, before you no longer found any speakers who did this specific version of T glottalization. Um, but that's not to say they don't glottalize other T's as well, because a traditional, say, Texas accent, accent might, they'll probably pronounce the T in mountain, um, but they might glottalize their T in a different place. Like if they were to say they got up the mountain first, sometimes they'll drop the T off the end in words. Um, you, you might hear like chess for chest. So that goes back to what I said about every region of the U.S. has some form of tea dropping. Um, in New England and the Northeast, this is our sort of specific version of it. And so by extension, it applies to the Boston accent. Okay, um, our next rule is another oddity with the letter T, um, although it's a bit less widespread as, um, than the last. So this is known as TH stopping. Uh, which is a tendency to harden both the voiced and voiceless TH sounds in words like the and three to the dental stops T and D respectively. So that produces duh for the and produces tree for three. Uh, this trend is actually common in American cities that were settled by significant populations of Irish and Italian immigrants. Um, because both Italian and many dialects of Irish English do not make use of the TH sound. So speakers of those languages will tend to use T and D as an approximation instead. Um, TH stopping is most closely associated with the New York City dialect, but it was known to exist in the North End and Southeast um, here as well. And I found that descendants of these immigrant groups from both of these areas tend to claim it as their thing, but in reality it could have came from either and probably came from both. Because um, like I said, both of those um, language groups, I Italian and Irish English, don't tend to use um, the letters T-H, um, the T-H sound, yeah. So, all right. Um, these last two rules once applied to many New Englanders, uh, and are now considered to be going extinct in speakers born after 1960 or so. So the next rule, known as the New England short O, is a middling of the short O sound in certain words to the same middle center uh sound uh, that is in words like done, love, uh, mother. So those words are examples that every English speaker is going to pronounce with a middle center O. But in New England, that simply once applied to a greater list of words. So over 50 years ago, instead of saying, I drove there yesterday, uh, you might hear someone say, I drove there yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> or instead of saying, I got in trouble, you might, you might hear, um, I got in trouble. So sometimes um, I find to like contemporary speakers, this can sound a little bit strange, but we will all still most likely have remnants of this rule in our pronunciation of everybody, which the rest of the country generally says everybody or everybody, right? Um, we generally we say everybody, and my own favorite is popcorn, right? <laughs> it should be popcorn, uh, given the rest of our rules here, but we we've retained the short O in that word specifically. I'm not really sure why. Um, <clears throat> But it's pretty iconic. <laughs> Last, we have the trap bath split. And this is actually similarly disappearing. Um, so if you recall the above rule, uh, <clears throat> the raised short, or the previous rule, the raised short A raises the vowel in words like trap to something like trap. 
um, in many urban American dialects. So previously in New England, there was an addendum to this rule, uh, wherein if a short A would occur before some voiceless fricatives, which are the consonants F, S, and TH, and certain nasal sounds, um, again, the letters N and NG, then rather than being raised to something like beth, uh, words following this pattern would actually be pronounced with the same rounded lot vowel, um, like in bother, producing bathroom uh, rather than bathroom. So my own grandmother actually does this, and while it certainly hasn't persisted very much um, in those under the age of 60, Again, most of us will show the remnants of this rule in our pronunciation of aunt, which most other Americans will pronounce ant. Uh, so you may have noticed that bathroom or aunt, right, uh, might sound a lot like how a speaker of British English may pronounce, pronounce those words. And indeed, all of these periphery features, the last few that we've been going over, especially T glottalization, are still very prominent features distinguishing British English uh, from most American dialects. So then, to circle back to our earlier question of how British actor Christian Bale is more easily able to affect a Boston accent than his American counterparts. Based on the rules we've learned, the simple answer may not be very surprising. Uh, there is a clearly traceable relationship between the Boston accent and British English. But, right, on the grand scale, we already knew that, right? Uh, the story of the pilgrims leaving England to found Plymouth Colony uh, is one we've heard since grade school, and like all former British colonies, um, of course the language was brought over as well, so that's not really a big reveal. Um, some of us may have heard pervasive theories about how Americans used to speak like the British until we became an independent people, and sort of artificially changed our use of language to disconnect ourselves um, from Britain. Or better yet, uh, some of us may have heard that Americans actually didn't change our way of speaking at all, uh, but rather that we somehow preserved a quote-unquote original English while British English continued to evolve enough to differentiate themselves from Americans. Um, so there are veins of truth and falsehood to both of those ideas. In reality, yes, at one time Americans and Brits sounded a lot alike, and yes, at various times there have been some pretty big divergences because language is constantly changing, and the British don't even sound like the British used to anymore. Um, so anyone with no notions of an original English that is not referring to Anglo-Saxon has simply not gone far back enough. Um, I have a sample here of uh, er early medieval English as it famously appears in the opening lines of Beowulf. Uh, and this is really one of the best preserved written documentations of early English. I'm, I'm sparing you flashbacks to high school English class. I will simply offer that uh, this looks nothing like this, right? Uh, <clears throat> and the only words your average reader would be able to recognize are probably we and in. Um, other than that, uh, and even those words would have been pronounced differently by the Anglo-Saxons, right? Um, we would have been more like we, and in would have been more like in. So if you were hearing it spoken, you wouldn't be able to recognize it back then, most likely. Okay, so how about this sample of Middle English from the anonymously authored Sir Gawain and the Green Knight? So this is after several centuries uh, this is several centuries later than Beowulf, and the language has changed significantly from the Anglo-Saxon form. Um, it's a little bit more discernible to contemporary speakers, but it's still by no means mutually intelligible. I mean, you can probably pick out a couple more words, uh, like now, um, there's, an, there's an is, uh, you can see here somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> And maybe, maybe even, you know, may, maybe you'd recognize green, right? It's spelled differently. Uh, but again, in this period, all of these words uh, would have been pronounced differently than they are today. Um, or rather, they would have been pronounced exactly as they are written, right? Meaning green uh, would have been more like gren. Uh, English writing at this time period, and for really most of the life of the English language, 
uh, was entirely phonetic. Uh, so for most of our history, uh, paper and ink was tremendously, tremendously expensive. If a letter was silent, they left it out. They didn't need it. Uh, <laughs> they didn't waste time on silent letters. And in many ways, it would have actually been a lot easier for speakers from these time periods to learn to read and write. Um, <clears throat> there's this pervasive myth that stems from mostly the Victorian era uh, that there was high illiteracy rates uh, amongst pre-modern peoples. And uh, that simply comes from a misunderstanding in interpreting historical fact. So <clears throat> Victorian era historians, they just simply romanticized a, a less civilized past, but they also misunderstood what the word literacy meant in a historical context. So literacy shares the same root as the word Latin or liturgy. Right? Um, so in the Middle Ages, literacy only referred to the ability to read Latin and liturgy. Um, since reading English of this period was as simple as sounding out the letters, uh, historically most people would have been able to read. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, we finally come to the origins of what is considered modern English with Shakespeare. Uh, so some of us may recognize the opening lines of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, um, but it might look a little different than you may remember. Uh, so most of the time, the spelling in mo modern printings of Shakespeare is actually changed to match our contemporary spellings. Uh, but shown here is the spelling as it would have appeared uh, when Shakespeare wrote it. Nonetheless, there's a couple differences, but I would say this is plenty intelligible um, to contemporary readers. We, we can make out most of this, even if, for better or for worse, we don't like reading Shakespeare. Um, but, and, and that, in, in and of itself, kind of feeds its own myth. Um, it's, it feeds the myth that because this is so readable to modern readers, that Shakespeare must have therefore spoken similarly to modern speakers. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, uh, <clears throat> linguistic reconstruction, however, uh, on trying to figure out how the language of Shakespeare's day was spoken has shown that not to be the case at all. So, with Romeo and Juliet in mind, I'm going to show you a passage performed by the British thespian Ben Crystal. Um, first, in a received pronunciation of modern British English, which for anyone who doesn't know, is essentially British English spoken without a regional inflection, uh, sometimes called the Queen's English. And then he's going to do it in a reconstruction of Shakespeare's English, which he calls original pronunciation. So uh, Ben's theater troupe at the Globe Theater in London was actually able to reconstruct the original pronunciation of 17th century English with the help of his father, um, the esteemed Welsh linguist David Crystal, um, whose combined work has become invaluable to uh, English historical linguistics. to be. And um, indeed, the Shakespeare's Globe asked that to uh, find out what this sound might be. And we've called this sound uh, original pronunciation. And uh, without any further ado, I'll let you hear what it sounds like. But by comparison, um, I will first uh, give a little bit of a speech in uh, received pronunciation. A received pronunciation is um, uh, in America, uh, you, you know, you call it good American, I think is the accent. Um, over here we have received pronunciation, and it is the accent that we are still told in drama schools today that if you don't speak it, you cannot and will not be hired to perform Shakespeare. Um, ironically, when I uh, auditioned for the Shakespeare's Globe uh, just under 10 years ago now, uh, in my audition I came and I, I gave my speech and my great received pronunciation, and the director looked at me and went, where are you from? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I grew up in Wales, and she said, do it in your Welsh accent. I did it in my Welsh accent. I got the job. <laughs> and did every single show in that accent, too. So it just goes to show, I suppose. Um, 
What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. So, um, the speech in received pronunciation and then in original pronunciation. And when I do the original pronunciation, um, I'd love to hear both from the people in the room and abroad. You're going to hear all sorts of different things. I'd love to hear what accents it reminds you of. Um, and I will exaggerate both accents a little bit for the effect. Um, the opening of um, Romeo and Juliet. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge, break to new mutiny, where civil blood lay civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal lines of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. <laughs> Same speech, and this is as close as we can get to what Shakespeare's accent would have sounded like, and the accent of his actors. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our sin. From ancient grudge, bred to new mutiny, where civil blood lays civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal lines of theirs two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take the life. Whose misadventured, piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. It's cool, isn't it? I like it. What accents does it remind you of? West Country, Scotland, Ireland, yeah. Arches. <laughs> the Arches is a radio show. It doesn't matter, I'll explain to you later. I'm explaining to the rest of the world. Um, yeah, other accents. American, yep. Pirate. You know, I go into. No, he, no, no, you see, I go into schools about once a month over here and in Europe, and wherever I go, whatever age, whether it's eight years old or 18 years old, and I say, what accent does it remind you of? And someone goes, Pirates of the Caribbean! Ha <laughs> Yes, indeed. No, it's true, though, and there's a reason for that, too. But yeah, other accents. Oxfordshire. There's a theme here. Say the accent you don't want to say because you think you'd be wrong. Midland? Yeah. I didn't get you didn't? Two old souls, both alike, in dignity, in fur of Verona, where we lear a sin. From age. I've had people say Canadian. I've had people say Australian. You're all right. Shakespeare's London was a melting pot of accents. People would come from Norwich and Wales and Scotland and Ireland and the Midlands and Somerset and pirate country. <laughs> and they come to London and their accents would all mix in together. And then of course later on they'd go to Bristol and sail across to America. And later still they'd be sent to Bristol and go down to Australia. And that's in part where those accents all come from. Notice what it did to me? Okay, so <clears throat> I imagine many of you would agree that the original pronunciation certainly sounds a bit Irish, Scottish, Australian, maybe even Canadian, and, and definitely pirate-like, uh, but maybe a bit too foreign to sound American. And, and I find it fascinating that American was one of the accents suggested by Ben's British audience. Uh, because I, I'm sure to many of us, and to me, it, it still sounds more British than anything, really. Um, but if you recall what I said earlier about native speakers, uh, how it's generally second nature for native speakers to pick out inconsistencies within their dialect, well, that goes both ways. So it could be just as easy for similarities, things that we are used to hearing every day, to fly under the radar, uh, because we're just used to those words sounding that way. So when they do, they don't stick out. Um, what Ben's native British audience was almost certainly picking up on that sounded Irish, Scottish, Canadian, and American to them, to them was undoubtedly the rhotic pronunciation, right? He didn't drop any of his R's. Uh, modern British English drops its R's, but Irish, Scottish, Canadian, and standard American English all pronounce their R's. And so did Ben when he did Shakespeare's English. Uh, how many of you caught that? No? Uh, if, if you didn't, it, don't worry, uh, because I... I <laughs> exactly, right, pirates, are. Uh, but I'm sure a number of Ben's audience members didn't catch that he was also dropping his H's, like an household, uh, which to an American audience is unmistakably British. Uh, 
So it does go to show that, like he said, there's really no right answer here. Uh, just as Ben pointed out, original pronunciation is the accent from which all these modern day English speakers have inherited their accents from. So you can hear trends from various parts of the English speaking world that were preserved in some regions and then lost in other regions. And by now, I'm sure the question on everyone's mind is, how could anyone possibly know what the original pronunciation of English of Shakespeare's time actually sounded like? Well, uh, as I said before, prior to the standardization of English, all spelling was phonetic, right? I mentioned that. Um, for most of human literary history, in fact, spelling was just perceived as a tool to record speech, right? So it was a guide on how to pronounce a word that could vary from region to region or even from speaker to speaker. And sometimes I think it'd be nicer if it was still that way. Um, but lucky for us, North Andover actually has a perfect example of this. Uh, so if you're a local, I'm sure the Stevens family name is familiar to you. We are in the Stevens Center right now, after all, and we're not very far from the Stevens estate. Um, among the Stevens family predecessors was James Stevens. Um, he was a carpenter born in North Andover in 1749, which was then just Andover, um, who later went on to serve as a Minuteman in the first year of the American Revolution in 1775. Here at the Historical Society, we're lucky enough to have the journal that James kept, uh, which documented his service, uh, and he wrote entirely in phonetic spelling, or just about entirely. Um, so let's take a look at the first entry uh, <clears throat> to get a sense for what colonial English was like uh, during this era. So this is the very first line of James Stevens' journal, and right off the bat we can see that James had a rather distinct spelling pattern. Um, we might see this today and think that it clearly indicates that he was uneducated, but even in this first line, uh, we're immediately shown that that is not the case. Um, so note the way that he records the date, right? Um, <clears throat> April the 19th, spelling the with a Y, which is where the TH sound would normally be. Uh, today, we use this a lot in our modern society just to make something sound old, right? Like ye old shop. Uh, but I find most people actually don't really know why. Uh, well, as we saw going all the way back to Beowulf, um, a ring, uh, English originally had its own letter for this sound, the TH sound. It was called a thorn. It looks a bit like a capital P. Um, if anyone want, is curious, I can go back later and, and show you. But um, starting in the 15th century, with the invention of the printing press, most printing presses at the time, in the early days, were manufactured in Romance language countries where their alphabet didn't include that character, the TH, uh, Thorn, it was a single letter. And so for many years, English printers simply decided to use a Y as a substitution. Uh, over time, TH, the combination of two letters, was adopted to represent this sound as well, but many printers kept to the tradition of using a Y because it was one fewer letter and it was cheaper, right? That tends to be a trend with language. Um, this actually had a strong enough impact on spoken English to change thou into you for all English speakers today. It was originally thou, and that's why we all say you, because um, for, for centuries, printing presses were using the letter Y. Um, so this is a really long-winded way of saying that James Stevens must have been at least somewhat well-read uh, because he uses a Y for the in writing dates, which is a convention he would only pick up on in printed sources, right, books. If he was only ever reading notes that people hand-wrote, um, he probably wouldn't have been exposed to that. Uh, so we know he knows the difference because he uses the that or uh, that th sound several times in the same sentence, right? So it's likely that he was dating this way, uh, which was meant to be read as formal um, or official, like you would see in a print source. This is significant because it's proof that James's particular spelling isn't just because he didn't know how to write. It, it's because, like everyone else in his time, he spells words more or less how he pronounces them. So in that regard, we can clearly see an early Bostonism in his insertion of an extra R into regulars. 
<laughs> and in this next passage, uh, note how similar the town names are to the way we actually say them today. Uh, Bill Ricca hasn't changed very much, but uh, I find that people that aren't from Massachusetts, the way that Tewksbury is spelled today, is tend, uh, tend to say it the way that I just said it and screwed it up. Uh, usually it's Tewksbury. And <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> often I have found in maps from the colonial period that our modern Massachusetts pronunciation uh, usually matches almost exactly the colonial spelling. Um, so I, like I, I've said, I also work at, in Haverhill uh, at the Buttonwoods Museum, and colonial maps will usually spell Haverhill H-A-V-E-R-I-L without the hill. Um, towards the end of the English standardization process, which we'll get to in a bit, uh, the spelling we use today was chosen as an official spelling, and the idea of phonetic spelling had been retired, which meant uh, that the spelling did not need to reflect the way Haverhill was actually pronounced, so the original colonial pronunciation was able to be preserved here. Um, and that, that is the case with many of our other place names, except for this one, uh, Lexington, which James writes as Laysentown. Um, I think that's super interesting, and I haven't really been able to find a reason why, um, but it must have been a quirk, uh, a regional quirk to his accent, um, the way that they said Lexington, because in other sources at the time, it's, it's written the same way we write it um, today. So... We can go on. Um, the, this is all from the, the first entry of his um, diary. He's describing uh, being late to the battles of Lexington and Concord and then um, heading out towards Bunker Hill afterward. So here we come to another Bostonism. Uh, look how James wrote horses. He wrote hosses. <laughs> And yet, just a few words before, he kept the R's, right, in for and burnt. Uh, here, his phonetic spelling, it serves as a snapshot of a time when non-roticism was just starting to develop, right? He doesn't drop all of his R's. Uh, he only drops them on some words. Because there was never a point when people suddenly decided to start dropping their R's in every word, right? It, la language changes very gradually. Uh, it was a process that happened over centuries. Um, and interestingly, um, <clears throat> this continues on, but a quick note. Um, another neat thing is he uses the uh, indigenous name for Arlington here, um, which, is, which was menotomy or notomy, as he says. Again, probably another... Um, regional quirk like Laysentown, which is strong evidence that the, the dialect we're seeing preserved here was probably very regionally inflected. Um, people didn't travel as far on a normal basis as we do. Um, so from town to town, or sometimes even from neighborhood to neighborhood or family to family, you might get, depending on how isolated people were, you might get really um, different words and, and voc uh, used and pronunciation and all of that. Um, <clears throat> In the next little bit, we see another partial non-roticism in his spelling of Charlestown, right? Uh, but that's immediately followed by Bunker's Hill, right? He keeps the R there, but he drops it in Charlestown. Uh, <clears throat> so I wish we had more time to break down the pronunciation of each and every word in here because there actually is a really a lot of interesting stuff, and I'd be happy to go back at the end and, and take um, questions if anyone's interested, but... Um, for those who would like to learn more about the Stevens Diary specifically, uh, I'll say that we're actually working on putting together an exhibit um, for the diary here at um, NAHS, which will overlap with this subject uh, quite a bit, so just keep your eyes out for that. Um, for now, it suffices to say that in the time since the colonial period, we've decided there is a correct and an incorrect way to spell a given word which makes it possible to understand writing from all English speakers, right? This standardization process arose uh, as a necessity during our time, target time period, as English was becoming a global language due to colonial expansion. So that makes it possible for, uh, say, a speaker uh, of Jamaican English writing from the Caribbean to be understood in writing by someone reading 
uh, a letter in Ireland, um, even if they speak the language very, very differently. Uh, you can imagine how difficult communicating overseas would be in writing if um, people continued spelling things exactly the way they pronounced them. Um, so the standardization of language is what linguists call orthoepy. Uh, and for English, this was a really long process uh, that first began in 1604, just under a decade after Romeo and Juliet was written, with the publication of Robert Caudry's first English dictionary, uh, although it wasn't a dictionary as we understand them in the same sense today. Instead, uh, Caudry's table alphabetical uh, only listed the meaning and usage for loan words that your average layperson was unlikely to know the meaning of. So scientific, uh, medical, philosophical, military, and literary terminology that was borrowed from uh, other languages, intellectual languages like Greek, Latin, and French. Um, <clears throat> the first dictionary, as we know them today, to list a conventional s definition and spelling for every word in the English language uh, would not come until long after, uh, a a would not come until after a long and terribly thrilling battle amongst English orthoopists, uh, which I'm sure, which I wish we had time to sidetrack into, but um, it culminated with the introduction of the first Royal Standard English Dictionary in 1775. And you may notice that this overlaps with American independence, the exact time period in which James Stevens was writing. Uh, and indeed, this new standard as of 1775 and sort of really everything preceding it only reached British audiences. Uh, American English wasn't standardized on the, at, on the same time frame um, as British English. And it wouldn't be until 1828 with the publication of Noah Webster's uh, Standard American Dictionary that English would be considered fully orthoopized, uh, fully standardized. For our purposes, we really only care about the idea that uh, during the American colonial period, our target time period, um, it overlaps almost year for year with the English orthoep orthoepic period. Uh, Jamestown was settled in 1607, America is declared independent in 1776. So we're comparing 1607 and 1776 to 1604 and 1775. They line up almost exactly. And so, therefore, the, re the reason that Shakespeare's English was pronounced so differently from ours, despite being spelled only somewhat differently, is because that is the period when sort of the first spellings in British English began to be fixed. Right, began to be standardized, while our modern pronunciations, especially in America, have continued to evolve and deviate significantly from those spellings which were once phonetic. Originally, they were based on the way people pronounced words, and they said, all right, we're just going to spell it this way now, but people were free to continue having their accents evolve and change. And we're talking over a course of three to four hundred years, right? so that's a lot of change. Um, sometimes it's actually the opposite, like in the case of our town names around here, and the older pronunciation is preserved even though the spelling was additionally changed, uh, uh, was officially changed later. Uh, but in either case, it just means that once you get rid of phonetic spelling, spelling and pronunciation don't need to match anymore. Um, so we've therefore lost spelling as a guide of how later American English was spoken. Right? We, we have a pretty good idea of how it was spoken thanks to phonetic spelling prior to standardization, full standardization. We don't have as much of a clear idea after the you know, 1770s. And we have to look to other systems to trace where the Boston accent came from, uh, which brings us to the great vowel shift. Uh, it is an ongoing process in the English language beginning circa 1400 which was first observed by the Danish scholar Otto Jespersen uh, around the turn of the 20th century. Basically, uh, Jespersen describes this process as a pull chain. That's his term. Uh, whereby a long vowel will shift to a different pronunciation with another long vowel then shifting to fill the gap which was left by the first vowel. Um, so this chart lays out the process specifically for British English. Um, and we can try and make sense of this a little bit. So take the first vowel in time as an example. Um, <clears throat> in time and words that rhymed with it, 
it was once pronounced with a long E sound around 1400. So it would have been something like team. Um, mine would have been pronounced as mean, uh, <clears throat> and so on. And by around 1700, that vowel had shifted to something more like toim. So the next vowel, in, which was originally in C, uh, and the words that rhymed with it, uh, was, which was originally pronounced like se, then shifted to make use of that empty long e sound. Uh, so se became c, and sort of kept on that path. Uh, <clears throat> and remember, this is for British English um, specifically. So the next vowel in words like east, uh, which was once pronounced like est, uh, shifted to est, the same vowel that used to be in C, uh, and so on. So we don't have to go over all of this, but basically the big idea is that the the pattern is when a vowel shifts, another vowel will shift to a similar position in the mouth. Um, because the, Engli the, the human mouth is actually only capable of making so many sounds. So if we lose a sound in our vernacular, eventually that sound will, will crop back up. Um, the, the big idea is that various parts of the English-speaking world are actually at different points in this process over time. So I'll reference again that first vowel in time. Uh, while the final stage, or rather the most recent stage, because remember this is an ongoing process, is the received pronunciation of time with an I sound. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and that roughly matches contemporary American pronunciation. But in many parts of the UK, uh, some regions still pronounce this more like toim, um, which is actually a preservation of the earlier colonial pronunciation, right? Because that's from the 16 and 1700s. So if we look at the, at the vowel in fox, um, this one is significant for us. So here the contemporary received pronunciation of fox um, is basically uh, the same as the colonial pronunciation. You can see it hasn't changed since 1600 um, in, in Britain. And that happens to be the exact same rounded lot vowel pronunciation that is so fundamental to the Boston accent. So New England is really the only region of the US to get stuck on this specific British archaism. Uh, <clears throat> But we've also paralleled newer British English trends in other ways where other Americans have preserved their own colonialisms. Um, <clears throat> most notably, British English has been fully non-rhotic uh, since the 1800s, a trend which became equally integral to the Boston accent and just the broader East Coast, while other US regions uh, beyond there have preserved the older colonial roticity. If you remember, uh, you know, Ben sounded like a pirate. Uh, colonial Americans generally pronounce their R's quite strongly. Um, so the idea is where some Britishisms have been preserved in some places, other Britishisms have been preserved in other places. And this equally applies to other former British colonies like Canada and Australia. Um, but there was a time when Boston speech was evolving almost in tandem with British English, producing what has effectively become known as the Boston Brahmin accent. Um, and I'm very glad to have found a quality recording of it, um, <clears throat> because as documented, it's mostly extinct now. But um, this is a clip from 1985 um, of a couple of Boston Brahmins and this clip is very long. Office plan. Miller just lobbed a message way over Jones's head using some technical. But not everyone feels comfortable being in the middle. There we go. There's more than makes up. She has a good 
nature, which I never did. She has a very good nature. Yeah. She's very, very charming and attractive. Girl. And she's got sense about things like money, too. That's something we all would like to have yeah, more. but don't. No. No, she you do, but I don't. No. And they say, I have nothing but cash. Nothing but cash? Nothing but cash. Really? Now that is... And that yeah, interests me yeah. very much. I, I'm inclined to think, I always remember back when you and I were very young and, and the Great Depression was at its worst. I remember a fellow I was at that time trying to pedal Waltham watches. I remember, I remember I used to throw them on the floor. Yes, that test was them. great. <laughs> yeah. and I remember I went down to, to uh, Lowell to sell watches at Christmas time, 1937. That was yeah. in the so-called recession. You might as well have tried to peddle Frigidaire's to the sure. Eskimos. Yeah. And there was another fellow with me, and I remember after a very discouraging day, I remember him saying, well, Tom, you've got just two friends in this world, yourself and your dollar. Yeah. <laughs> you can't carry cynicism much further than that. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so, I don't know about you, uh, but it's remarkable to me how easily these gentlemen, particularly the one on the right, uh, might be mistaken for modern British English speakers by an American audience. I'm sure British English speakers could pick out some differences that we can't, but the Boston Brahmin accent is sort of a near-perfect halfway point between American and British English. Um, and that perfectly demonstrates how we got to where we are today. Um, I won't go into another full breakdown of the Brahmin accent rules, which would be a little bit redundant because there's actually much more in common with the normal Boston accent than you'd think. But um, I will say we're just really a few tweaks away from sounding as British-esque as these fellas do. Um, for anyone disappointed that I didn't show a clip of the Kennedys, uh, while I know they're probably most wi the most widely remembered example of a Boston Brahmin accent, they actually didn't speak with a Brahmin accent at all. Uh, rather, the Kennedys generally spoke with an everyday Boston accent and affected Brahminisms to try and disguise it to sound more highbrow for political benefit. <laughs> so their their accent remains so distinctly recognizable as the Kennedys because it was a fabrication. It was artificial. Nobody actually spoke like that in their everyday lives. Um, but due to JFK's publicity in particular, it became the hallmark Boston accent for many people across the U.S. who had never heard another Boston Bostonian speak. They they knew Kennedy, um, but nonetheless. The Kennedys are an excellent exa uh, example of the Boston accent's sociolinguistic factors, which we would be remiss to not address. Um, especially in the context of the 20th century, the Boston accent has come to form a close association um, with socioeconomic and cultural identity, which has permeated beyond politics into art, music, movies, you name it. Um, this association is the entire reason why the Kennedys attempted to distance themselves from it, right? Um, and it's the entire theme underlying movies like Good Will Hunting. It's also largely shaped our identity in the eyes of other Americans and is in some ways a tourist attraction of its own, um, <laughs> selling a slew of Wicked Pissa merchandise every year, right? I, I, nobody around here wears anything like that or... I, you hardly hear Wicked Piss anymore, but it's, it's being sold all the time in tourist shops. Um, sometimes it's also the butt of a good joke, uh, which is how it found its way into Looney Tunes. Uh, so Bugs Bunny voice actor Mel Blanc affected a very easily recognizable New York City accent, a Brooklyn accent, uh, for his uh, character Bugs Bunny. 
But it's less commonly known that Elmer Fudd's voice actor, Arthur Q. Bryan, was said to have affected a caricature of a Boston accent in order to contrast the two characters when he was doing Elmer Fudd. Um, and that was supposed to be a play on the, the New York versus Boston rivalry going back to the early 1900s. Uh, both of those actors were lifelong New Yorkers, so it was no accident that uh, Elmer Fudd was always made the fool. Uh, <laughs> well, Bugs always came out on top. But um, we've heard enough from actors and cartoon characters. There's nobody really more fit to comment on the Boston dialect's sociolinguistic identity than real Bostonians from the heyday of the Boston accent. So I'm going to play some more clips uh, from the Center for New American Media. Uh, they're the same organization that back in the 80s recorded those two Brahmins talking. Um, and, and people in these clips are going to discuss a variety of things, including interpersonal and interclass and interregional implications of the way they speak. Technical difficulties. Oh, no. Uh, you tend to ripple in the communication uh, level you've come to uh, experience. People in the North End is particularly, as I say, revel in the fact that they speak a certain way. And if you speak some way other than that, they find you to be different. And I can't express it more than uh, to say they really revel. They go further than what they really should. In other words, to communicate with one another, they don't have to say ka, it's like they said, but they'll say it even more just to emphasize the fact that that's where they're from. Julio, come here, will you please for a minute? You look all good, what's the matter? Rough night? Seriously, did you make it on my party Friday? Well, you'll find that a lot of what us happened? really do express ourselves differently. And if my brother Philip was here, he has yet another way of expressing himself. He'd probably be the best one. Yeah. Why? What is, what's, what's he saying? He definitely has an accent, a Boston, not then accent. The reason why Philip has it so strong and emphasizes it and uses it to his advantage is because he's the only one out of the five of us that actually really grew up in the North End. It's fine for the area. It's fine for your family, you know, but when you travel outside the area and travel outside the family, you're going to have to pronounce your R's, you're going to have to um, think of what you're saying, and you're going to have to articulate. And all we could do is talk in one manner. I would never change growing up in the city. The best thing that ever happened to me really was. It's, just, it's such an advantage over people. As you go to a club, you start talking to a babe, and she says, you Italian? And she, what makes you think that? She says, you talk like an Italian. And then you start giving it the accent. Yeah, you guys, and uh, where you's from, and I'm with three of my friends. I chew the football all day. The committee. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? When? First three rows. Are you? Watch. You walk right in like the older giant. Seriously. Bro. I'd be lost without growing up in the city and having these assets. I use them as an asset instead of a liability, you know? And when they went to college, it was a liability for my brothers. You know, but then again, they ain't as smart as me. There we go. <clears throat> Different things like that. Well, we hear about Boston Brahmin. Pardon me? 
Well, they had the, they something had like this young like, lady is talking you know, right they, now. The Kennedys talk like, like a they went to twang on the end. They went to prep schools and different colleges. Yes, they, some of the some of the girls went to Radcliffe. And Radcliffe. Where's the other friend? Usually had to speak through your nose. You they, know. But we never did that. We went we to never, public schools. We went to public schools, <laughs> the parochial school. Did, they, did you ever want to talk like the way they talk? No. I sometimes I put them on and everything, and I might do that. I said, "Park your car." <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> Oh, get this guy over here. That's a school ball business yeah. agent. Yeah. <laughs> no, why would why would they want to talk like that? No. They, would they want to talk like uh, we talk? No. Yeah. No. I think they make fun of the way they talk. Uh, yeah, they, they could, but uh, I do that too myself when I go over there. Now I'll be over in town today and I said, beg your pardon. <laughs> See, I'll give them the same business. I can No, they might make fun of it over here, but uh, that's a bother of us. They're no better than us, and we're no better than them. What the hell? Never bothered me. No, that's it. Yeah. Now, have you notice that uh, all over the country, as far as California, as far as Texas, and up in the Montanas, and in New York, and Chicago, and New Jersey, they all come to Massachusetts to get an education. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised if Boston University's got about 15,000 enrollment now, that's all the night and day classes. You'd be surprised how many come from New York or New Jersey. Yeah. Can you tell them? Yeah, I can. Sure can. I give an experience. I was working one time for the mail. Make sure you write this down and put it in there. And I was picking up the box inside the dormitory over there and be you. And a young lady come from New York come running down and she gave me a letter. She says, I want to make sure I get a mail this. She didn't have it even written out yet. But she wrote it out to me. Dear Mama, Dad, do it fine, send me a hundred. Love, Susie. I mailed a letter. That's a true story. That's a true story. <laughs> what do you think of uh, the way people talk in Boston? Why? Well, they have their own slang. It's just like they have in New York and every other place. I think they talk very good. <laughs> Can you tell different neighborhoods? Uh, a few you can tell the difference. Like you can tell people from Dorchester or even from Mattapan, uh, where they come from. Oh yeah, Roxbury. I'm from South Boston. You can always, can you always tell somebody from South Boston if you better than the the world. Oh sure, sure. Their nose always goes in the head. Do you think um, has anybody ever told you you have an accent? Sure, when I meet people from around, around the country, like some of Texas, they say, you're from Boston. You park your car in the backyard and play cards? That's what they say. What about anyway. people on Beacon Hill? Well, yeah, well, you meet people, and they have a little uh, uh, tootie tootie, you know, and up there, they, they kind of look down at you. <laughs> and how do they talk? Do they talk differently? Oh, yeah, they talk differently. Yeah. And they have the, more like a more polished. No. <laughs> the uh, they asked, "Does it ever make you feel bad?" Uh, <laughs> he said, "No." Um, the the one big rule that we can't deny about the Boston accent that we haven't mentioned so far is the shouting over the airplanes. Uh, if you're in <laughs> Southie, right? <laughs> but uh, no, I th I think these folks they all summed it up really well. Um, the Boston accent has such a strong sociolinguistic connotation that some chose to hide it while others embraced it. And for some, it was a way to distinguish themselves from their neighbors and also to recognize their peers. Um, and while I don't have a Boston accent, all of my older relatives on my mother's side do. Um, so these ideas are still very familiar to me, having grown up in a family with you know, similar sentiments, as I'm sure they are to some extent for most New Englanders. Um, <clears throat> the last few generations have lived through a very interesting time for the Boston accent. Um, on the one hand, uh, <clears throat> the creation and renovation of new highways from the 1950s uh, to the 2000s allowed the Boston accent to spread to just about any town within commuting distance um, of the city when it was previously much more localized to the city limits, workers were able to move to the suburbs and bring their accent with them. 
And yet, on the other hand, at the same time, the number of overall speakers has been trending downward since the 1960s. So the Boston accent exists in this statistical oddity where the geographical distribution is at an all-time high. I mean, you'll hear the Boston accent two hours, three hours from Boston. Um, I used to live uh, west of Worcester, right? Which, who, how many of you have been west of Worcester? You wouldn't expect to, to hear... <laughs> Worcester, yeah, yeah. Uh, you wouldn't expect to hear people with a, a Boston accent out there, but at these days, they're, they're there. Now, they're generally older folks. Um, so while the geographical distribution is at an all-time high, the total number of speakers is simultaneously at an all-time low. Um, we've learned that features coming and going um, have always been a part of the evolution of English, and our dialect is no exception. Uh, nor is it alone in its downward trend. Uh, just about every regional U.S. dialect has been experiencing some form of dilution in the digital age, right? As population centers like New York and especially California are global media hubs whose dialects are reaching more and more speakers every day. Um, and for Boston specifically, as it was pointed out from our friends in the 80s, uh, We've always been a, a university hotbed, right, since the earliest establishment of, of Harvard, uh, which draws in thinkers from across the world who then bring their dialects with them. Uh, so younger generations are perpetually ever more introduced to linguistic trends from other parts of the country or even other parts of the world. Um, but, uh, so to close on a lighter note, uh, let's take a look at some terms that definitely aren't going to go away anytime soon uh, because it's not just an accent that makes up a dialect, right? The words we choose to use in the first place are just as much a part of the way we speak as is the way we say those words. Um, so we're just going to go through some of these and... Um, oh, actually, I, for I forgot. Based on everything we've learned, it, it, it should be uh, no surprise that we've preserved other trends uh, from other dialects of English. So let's start with what is undoubtedly our signature, uh, wicked, right? <laughs> Which Rachel Drast mi mi misused in that commercial. But um, wicked in uh, the way we use it is an adverbial intensifier, um, or put more simply, it's a synonym for very, right? Um, I promised earlier we'd come back to this, and, and now we will. Uh, so you may have heard that our love of wicked came from the Salem Witch Trials, uh, which have a big connection to North Andover, uh, if you didn't know. But um, <clears throat> that was allegedly due to its abundant sh usage in court records. It shows up a lot in documents from, that, um, from the witch trials. But in that context, it was being used in the same way it's still used by most other English speakers today, right? Not as a synonym for, uh, for very, but as a synonym for evil, right? That's not the way that we use it. Um, <clears throat> however, at the use of wicked as a synonym for very does predate the witch trials by quite a bit, at least three decades. Um, and that's with the earliest written documentation I can find. Uh, so it seems that the first use in print that uh, has been preserved was from a play uh, called A Witty Combat or The Female Victor, which was written in 1663 by Thomas Porter. He was a, a British playwright who in the play wrote, Yesterday was a hot day, a wicked hot day, uh, which doesn't, you know, it's not an unfamiliar uh, statement to us today. Um, and as much as I'd love to credit this as the origin of the term, as far as I can find, it more or less disappears um, from writing uh, after this. I also find to this day that uh, wicked is a term that we seldom use in writing at all, maybe in a text, but um, you know, if you were writing a letter, I find a lot of people probably wouldn't use wicked. And it's almost like as if we know it's informal, uh, so we just reserve it for... Uh, casual speech. Perhaps that's always been the case, and it's thus been un in you know an undocumented use that way for much longer. But I doubt it, uh, since you'd then expect this usage to pop up in other older dialects. But nobody else um, uses wicked, so it probably hasn't really been around you know uh, more than or longer than the 1600s. 
So I wish I had a more fulfilling answer about Wicked, but with the lack of evidence, the verdict is still pretty much up to conjecture. And though I will offer you my own theory, um, so this hasn't been corroborated by contemporary scholarship, but I actually see a clue in Irish English. Um, so we all know 19th century Boston was an Irish immigrant um, epicenter, and it happens that a convention of Irish English at that time period was a preference for repurposing certain adjectives as adverbial intensifiers in place of traditional intensifiers. So rather than saying something was very good, a 19th century Irish immigrant might say something was right good, um, which is an adjective being repur right is an adjective being repurposed um, as a synonym for very. Uh, and so while I can't directly credit the use of the adjective wicked in this way, it doesn't show up, um, at least from Irish English speakers, the underlying grammatical principle is still the same. Uh, so you can at least see it as a parallel to how it may have developed here um, and became our w most well-known colloquialism. Uh, so, but there are other terms we use every day that some may not realize are also unique to this area. So now for fun, we're going to flip through some of them and we'll see if uh, we can guess the terms here, but also the terms in other parts of the country. So what do we call this one? Sella. Yeah, the cella. Um, this one's easy, right? It was just mentioned in the last um, passage in the play. Um, so notice I've marked this as an archaism as well, because the term is another colonial preservation here. Most of the rest of the country only says basement. Um, so how about this one? Yeah, pa Pala. Um, so coming off the last one, this one's a giveaway. Uh, but it's also another archaism from the colonial period. Most of the rest of the country only uses living room or den. Um, older speakers will usually say Pala. Okay. What about this one? The clicker, yeah. <laughs> So this one also has its root in history, but it's not actually not entirely unique to Boston. Uh, the wi so wireless TV remotes made, a, the first wireless TV remotes made a clicking sound that they used um, with ultrasonic tuning to, to signal to the TV set. The East Coast was among the first places to get a lot of new technologies, so you might hear this in other um, cities too. I think in, there are some cities in the Midwest where they say clicker as well. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, what about this one? Someone already said it. Yeah, the bubbler. Uh, this is another giveaway, but the, der the derivation of this one is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, it's what it does. Um, and most of the rest of the country usually says drinking fountain, uh, water fountain. <laughs> yeah, the water fountain. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> what about this one? Rotary, yeah. So th this one's a really good example of what I was saying before about California dialects replacing others because your GPS probably calls this a roundabout or a traffic circle because it was programmed in Silicon Valley, right? So those are West Coast terms, and that's what they say. Um, but Rotary definitely isn't going out of style anytime soon. It's on all our road signs, and we kind of invented them. So uh, we're, the you know, we're the homeland of Rotaries, for better or worse. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, what about this one? T. Yeah, the T. Uh, so this one instantly will give you away as a Bostonian. Uh, here, whether it's a streetcar, a subway, a commuter train, they're all the T, right? We don't call them anything else. But um, e even the silver line is the T to me, and that's a bus, more or less. <laughs> like... <laughs> Uh, so I, I used to try and catch myself and say, you know, if I was in a different city like New York and try to say subway to avoid getting called out, but um, calling public transit the T is just so much easier than saying subway or metro, and, you know, I'm not going to bother with it, so they can make fun of me if they want to. All right, how about this one? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, believe it or not, um, this is actually not just a New England thing. Uh, they also use Packy in South Carolina, um, and it's actually for the same reason that we do. So in the years leading up to Prohibition, liquor was sold to retailers in large kegs and bottled by the store owner to be sold. Manufacturers didn't bo bottle their own liquor back then. Um, 
And this led to problems as retailers could sell cheap liquor uh, for high prices with a high brow label uh, and mispackage it as a high quality brand. So some states passed laws requiring liquor to be sold in original packaging as bottled by the brewer so that the state would collect the proper tax revenue from the sale price. Um, so in Massachusetts and South Carolina, the term original package store was actually used in the legislation. And this prompted liquor stores in these states to advertise their official status as original package stores, which was too much of a mouthful, which was shortened to package store and then just packy. Um, okay, how about this one? Carriage, yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of. Um, this one's one of my favorites because I actually hadn't realized it was a New England thing until college when I met people that weren't from here. Um, most of the rest of the country calls this a shopping cart. Um, but I, I've not heard carriage um, used by anyone that wasn't from New England. All right. <clears throat> this one? Anyone? Frap. Yeah, there we go. Um, so... This actually likely didn't originate in New England, but it's pretty firmly a part of our vocabulary now. Um, the, the story that I've read is that frap came from store owners advertising that milk, the treat of a milkshake or a frap to 20th century French Canadian mill workers. And the French Canadian mill workers had been using the term frap, so in order to increase sales, stores started advertising that treat as a frap. Um, but it's actually not, uh, frap is not the only New England term for a milkshake. Does anyone know what else? Cabinet. Cabinet. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Are you from Rhode Island? <laughs> Connecticut. Okay. Uh, so yeah, um, in, Rhode, in Rhode Island they say cabinet, which most likely came from a time when the ice cream added to the milkshakes was stored in an ice box, an ice chest, or an ice cabinet. At least that's what I've read. Um, so customers could order a regular milkshake or a cabinet milkshake, which was, again, too much of a mouthful. So it got chopped to, to cabinet. Okay, and finally, about this one. Common, yeah. Yeah, so um, as far as I can find, most other cities outside of New England will use some variation of center park, city park, or center green. Um, but common seems to be a New Englandism left over from when the land was held in common, uh, meaning that it was public land that anyone could use for grazing livestock. So this, again, comes from the colonial period. Um, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong if you're from another reason, region where they also say common, but I've, usually other cities will say some variation on, like, Center Park. Uh, <clears throat> So in any case, um, this is a nice image for our closing thoughts because language changes a lot. It, it, that's the number one thing we've learned. And although some of our regionalisms are firmly here to stay and others are trickling out, uh, there's really no telling what regionalisms might pop up in the future. Right? A high university population and our cultural connections to the rest of the country are just as much a part of our identity as is the way we speak. Um, so just because we may not be using Boston, you know, uh, accent quirks and terminology from, you know, 70 years ago, there may be new colloquialisms that we're developing right now that uh, when we come back to this subject in 50 years, maybe we'll have more. Um, <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> I hope overall you've enjoyed learning about our dialect, and I encourage you to share uh, what you've learned, as well as to support uh, the North Andover Historical Society if you want to see more programs like this um, in the future. I thank you all for coming, and I'd love to take uh, some questions if we have any. Uh, yes, uh, in, in the hat. Okay. So uh, some so we say thought and caught, whereas uh, in uh, the, a better example would be the the caught and caught, right? So C O T versus um, C A U G H T. So right, it's the same here exactly. That that's the point. And in New York, um, they say caught for the thing you sleep on, and you got caught by the police, right? So they they use one unrounded vowel and one rounded vowel. 
Um, they, they, they would say, um, yeah, thought. They would say thought. Um, there's not an, uh, a word that directly, lo- like, you know, we don't have a, a synonym for thought, but yes. Mm-hmm. And if they answer in the affirmative, they'll say yes. <laughs> yes. I wonder, um, how many of those sort of subdialects? Uh, so, yeah. So a lot of those things, because they're you know more isolated, they uh, they don't get recorded as well as like the the kind of big features. The the specific feature that you're pointing to um, would be known as um, breaking vowels or diphthongization. So that's taking a vowel that's normally one syllable and breaking it into two. That's actually not um, just a thing that's unique to certain areas in New England. Lots of parts of the U.S. do that. It's a key feature of Southern American English. Um, so it tends to pop up in rural areas. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not necessarily like, maybe it's you know, unique to uh, Boston English around here, but it does pop up in other, other parts of the country. Do we have any more questions? <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, would ima- I would imagine so, yeah, simply because the way that we say scallops is using the rounded lot pronunciation that other parts of the countries don't have, right? So um, I have heard scallops quite a bit as well, um, and I feel like I would almost use them interchangeably depending on who I was talking to. But, for example, a Midwesterner wouldn't say scallops or scallops. They'd say scallops, right, which is sort of in between. Yes. In uh, Stephen's writing, you mentioned it was phonetic. Yeah. Hosses. Hosses, yeah. Do you see that disappearing? My parents, my grandparents, everybody in my family over the age now of, say, 70, still says hosses. Yeah. But I say, I'll say horse. Mm-hmm. This is still not an hour there, but nobody ever says hosses. And when we hear it, it is. Yeah, right. It's, yeah, it's very indicative of an older way of speaking. I mean, so technically, the, those two pronunciations are just like a, one is a more extreme version of the same rule. So it's, it's the, the lowering and backing of vowels like I was talking about. So if you say hosses, that's really throwing the vowel back. If you say horses, that's just not as much. So it's, it's like a, you know, de- degrees of difference between what is essentially the same rule. Yes, in the front. What happened to the Brahmin accent? The Brahmin accent um, basically faded out because uh, it eventually took on negative associations, right? Like a lot of the those guys from the '80s were, especially the guys from Southie, they were making fun of the, you know, the the Boston Brahmin accent, and yeah, it's too posh, and because of the ties to sociolinguistic identity, and also the fact that. Um, it used to sort of be the other way around, whereas the, the people with a working class Boston accent would live in the city limits, right? And mo- the, the people with a Brahmin accent would live just outside the city in places like Brookline and Newton and, oh, oh yeah, and Wellesley, right, Weston. All the, the demographics have kind of shifted, right? It's way too expensive for working class people to live in Boston anymore. So that Boston uh, accent, the inner city accent, has flooded to the suburbs. And now, with the especially with the Brahmin generation being older and it was already kind of a, a dying breed that was trending out, you really, it's, it's considered extinct. I mean, I don't think there are any people who grew up speaking with a Boston Brahmin accent left. My mom's really? Wow. Uh, 88. 88. Okay, so that, that's, pr- that's pretty old. Yeah, um, that's, that's remarkable. Do um, you have any insight onto the way she pronounces things? I really, I really think it has to do with, um, you know, white flight. So that's, what, that's what happened to that accent, is that it escaped, and then it, it did that because it, it wasn't um, concentrated enough. Yeah, yeah. It was, a, you know, it, you're, you're never going to have uh, as tight of a linguistic imprint on something that is like, you know, in a much smaller community than there is in a bigger community. But yes, a, a woman here had a is question. Is also true of the um, Connecticut lockjaw accent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I have heard talk about that. Um, I, I don't know the origins of the, the, the lockjaw sort of accent, but I, I actually do know 
um, a couple of Bostonians that grew up on the South Shore that did that as well. I'm, I'm not really sure where, where it comes from. I'd have to look into it, to be honest. In the back, yes. Yes, yeah. And, and yeah, the, every, every version of you know, English has their own word for a bunch of different kinds of food, and we're no exception, for sure. All right. Can I talk about the program in two weeks? Sorry about that? Are there any other questions? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Feel free. I know Joanne is going to go and thank you, but um, if you like this program, come back in two weeks. Um, t on, uh, so two weeks from tonight, on April 9th, we have um, for our next speaker, Dan Gagnon, who is a historian and um, high school English teacher and has written a book about Rebecca Nurse um, called A Salem Witch. So he will be here talking about witch trials. And, um, and one of the most famous witches of the Salem witch um, hysteria time period. So that I expect a full house on. We've already sold over 50 tickets, 55 tickets for us sold. It's also free. Um, so check the North Andover Historical Society website to get tickets for that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so for anyone who's interested in this subject uh, further, some sources I would recommend um, checking out would definitely be the work of David Crystal, The Stories of English. That, that's um, Ben Crystal's father. He's a linguist. Um, <clears throat> also, um, this book, uh, Mapping Boston, it might be kind of hard to find. Um, I found, I, the only place I could find one was a used bookstore, but it talks a lot about how the city has changed, um, like demographically, geographically. It's, it's really cool. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, I'd, I'd be, I'll be here for a little bit if anyone else has some more questions. But thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.